thanking you for your gifts of love and joy and talent that you poured into this precious brother. Lift him up now into your hands, Lord, guide him, Lord, bring him prosperity, health, and joy, and double measure for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
by the time we get to the end of the day, and Sister Nancy's busy editing all the material and getting it ready for YouTube. Sometimes we have to ask you, what was the name of that sermon again? What was the title of that sermon? But today, I'm going to start with this title. I might change it by the time we get to the end of the day. But fellowshipping with Christ. Fellowshipping with Christ. John 8, 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth ever. Father, we dedicate the remainder of this meeting to you today. Speak to us. Speak to us, Father. Send your anointing for our, for our voices, for our ears, for our minds, and for our hearts. And may we receive everything that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Here we see people that Jesus is ministering to that believed in him. They believed in his message, that he was the Messiah. He was the one that could help them. These particular people were Jewish. It's important that we see this. It's important that we hold on to it. You see, these people, these Jews, had a history of following God. This history also reveals to us that these Jewish people were often falling into habits and norms and ideas that God was not pleased with. We've been studying in the sanctuary class for a long time about God dealing with the, 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 the Jewish people, the Hebrew people. I'm sorry, what was your title, Brother Bill? Fellowshipping with Christ. Thank you for that. I didn't hear that for a long time. Context of what we're reading today, I want you to realize that these Jewish believers, these people that had habits and norms and, and, and things in their world that were somewhat in need of change, these people had heard the message of Jesus and they believed on Jesus. But here Jesus himself is informing them that there's more to being a follower than just believing. There's more to fellowshipping with Christ than just believing in Him. Amen. He said they must continue in His Word. They must dwell in His Word. They must live by His Word. They must find their sustenance from His Word. You see, brother and sister, there's a path that we need to walk. He's telling these people, there's a path we need to walk. And that path is found in the Word of God. It's not found anywhere else. We have a lot of good doctrines. We have a lot of good religions. We have a lot of good teaching out there that helps us find our way as followers of Jesus Christ. But only God's Word should be the authority in this path that we follow. Can you say amen? amen. And he says... Then are you my disciples indeed. In other words, if you find this path and walk in this path, then that's what makes you a fellowshipper with me. A disciple we call them sometimes. 
You know, the word disciples in its simplicity just means a follower. Just means a follower. And then Jesus says to these same Jewish people, He says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, the path that the Word of God wants us to get on is called truth. Yes. It's called truth. And there's constant debate goes on about what truth is right and what truth is wrong. And how truth can be one viewed one way and how truth can be viewed another way. Brother and sister, that's exactly the same argument that, that the serpent made against Eve in the garden. He just started putting that little bit of deception in there. He started questioning truth. There's only one truth, brother and sister, and it's not Brother Bill's, it's God's. Amen. There's only one truth, and it's not Assembly of God or Baptist or Methodist. It is God's truth. Amen. And it's found in His Word. Yes. In His Word. See, it's not, it's not your truth. It's not my truth. It's God's truth. We live in a time when so many people claim to be Christians, and yet there's no change in their life. There's no freedom in their life. There's no joy in their life. There's no power in their life. And it's because, brother and sister, while they're wearing the cloak of Christianity, they're not fellowshipping with Jesus. See, when I say that I'm a Christian, I'm saying that I want to be like Jesus Christ. And I'm endeavoring to be like Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm endeavoring to walk like He walked, talk like He talked, live like He lived, eat what He ate, do what He did, be like Him. That's what I mean when I say Christian. But that's not what the world means anymore when they say Christian. It's a false title these days. How do we know that it's a false title? It's because of what they're fellowshipping with. What they're fellowshipping with. You see the world, these, these so-called Christians, these pseudo-Christians, they're, they're, they're embracing sin. And they're justifying unscriptural practices. Now, Jesus said only the truth can make you free. The truth can make you free. And now, let's go a little farther in the conversation with these, these Jewish believers. Verse 33. They answered him. They spoke to him and said, Jesus, we be Abraham's seed, and we've never been in bondage to any man. Well, these poor guys didn't know much about their history because they had been slaved in Egypt, they've been slaved in Babylon, they've been slaved in Mesopotamia. They, they, they were constantly being run over and, and overcome and becoming slaves. It was a constant theme in the Jewish history. Right. Then Jesus starts, remember now, he's talking to believers. Get a hold of this. He's talking to believers. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They believe that he's the Messiah. I say unto you, I'm telling you something here. Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. Did you know that this is where the big debate begins right here. Here is where we start dealing with religious traditions and doctrine. And our conversation has to take a certain path. See, these Jews were confused, let's say, about the subject matter concerning freedom. They thought because they were born in a certain place, in a certain family, that because of their birthright, that they were already free. They even claim we've never been in bondage to anybody. And these particular Jews probably haven't been in bondage to anybody. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. If you commit sin, if you willingly, knowingly commit sin, you're the slave of that sin. This word servant here is interchangeable. 
Either way, you can call it servant or slave. See, Jesus wasn't talking about a social freedom. He wasn't talking about a national freedom. Jesus was only talking about being free from sin. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's all he was talking about. Do you know that most people, most people when we start talking about sin, they'll, they'll, just, they'll just talk to you about sin all day long until you get down to the one that worries them. Amen. Amen? I've had people come to the doors of this church and love this church and want to join this church and be a part of it until I started preaching about their sin. The one that they were involved in. The one that they, they stand there, no, that's not sin, that's not sin, that's not sin. If you ever have to justify something you're doing and by saying it's not sin, I promise you it already is. You don't have to justify yourself if you're not sinning. You only have to justify yourself when you are sinning. Hmm. You see, what these Jewish believers need was they needed freedom from sin. He says, the servant, I remember he's talking about the servant of sin, the slave of sin, abideth not in the house forever. That's sobering, folks. Jesus is plainly teaching these believers that if you have sin in your life, I'm not going to keep you in my house forever. You're not going to have an eternal place with me forever. It doesn't exist. Only the sons abide ever. Now remember now, this is the teaching of Jesus. This is not an assembly of God doctrine. This is not something that the Baptists come up. This is Jesus, and this is what Jesus is teaching believers. Why would Jesus tell us to stop sinning and stay away from sin and don't become enslaved by sin if it was impossible to do that? He wouldn't. He wouldn't. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, the Word of God says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father to you. Ye shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Oh, I pray that we realize what he's saying here. We can't be like the world. We can't act like the world. Now, I want to take a little bit farther. We can't even think like the world when it comes to sin. That's right. When it comes to sin, now. How can we make it and stand before God and expect God to say, well done, if we've embraced something that He has condemned in His Word? I've heard a lot of people say, well, I'm going to get my life cleaned up and then I'm going to serve God. If you could clean it up by yourself, you wouldn't be where you are. <coughs> you can't clean yourself up. You can't educate yourself up. You can't, you can't discipline yourself up. Brother and sister, we all need Jesus Christ because sin always conquers us without Jesus and His blood. Right. Yeah. And what the first place that sin conquers us is in our mind. It's in our mind when we justify our actions, our practices, and our habits. Oh, my prayer is that we never, never find ourselves in a place like these Jewish believers in the scripture that we read earlier. That we don't become slaves to sin just because it's easier, it feels good, or it's popular. 
or some preacher somewhere said it wasn't sin. I'm not going to stand before God because see I have to answer to God for what I preach. I have to answer to God. And I want to stand before God and I want to hold my hands up and say, God, I told him that it was sin. I, I declared that it was sin. I read it in your word where it was sin. My hands are clean, Lord. I told them. Amen. They chose to believe a lie rather than the truth. 1 John 1, verses 3 and 4. That which we have seen and heard declare we, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. What we've seen, what we've heard, what we've declared, is because of our fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Our fellowship with the Lord. That's why I chose this title, Fellowshipping with Christ. Do you realize that the more you fellowship with Christ, the more value you are to those around you? Amen. Come on now, church. The closer you and I get to Jesus and the more we become like Jesus, the, 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 the greater asset we are to the kingdom of God. If we can be so full of Jesus, be so Christ-like, that His love in us begins to leak out of us. And one of the great ways for that to happen is through fellowshipping. Don't you just love fellowship? I, 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 was, I was reading one of those little funny antidote things the other day, and they were talking about how that, uh, uh, the, 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 the children in the class were asked to bring something that would uh, explain their religion to the rest of the class. And one little boy brought a crucifix, and he was a Catholic, and he said, you know, this, is, this represents our church. And another one brought uh, uh, some other artifact and showed it, and, and the, the last little boy got up, and he had a big casserole dish, and he said, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> Amen. 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 He, he, I was going to say, he, he was probably the one that everybody remembered. We love to fellowship, don't we? And it's, it's a normal thing to fellowship around food and, 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 and to let our lives become intertwined in such a way that we can encourage one another in, in ways that we can... And, and, you know, uh, you, you get in more trouble faster when you don't have anybody that you're accountable to. Did you know that? Yes. We're all that way. We're all that way. We, we need a, a level of accountability. Amen. My, my dad tried to put it in me a lot of different ways. <laughs> so <mine>. Sticks and <laughs> leather straps and, well, whatever. <laughs> but <laughs> the, the, the idea is we need to be accountable. Well, think about it from a different point of view. If we're so much in fellowship with Christ, that our fellowship, like it says in this scripture right here, I just read it to you. Our fellowship in Christ, it's, it, it, these miracles are coming to you because of our fellowship with Jesus. My messages come to you because of my fellowship with Jesus. And yes, He uses my voice and my mind and, and these things, but it's really the Holy Spirit speaking to you, wanting to fellowship with you and showing you God's opinion about things. And he said, these things, he said, I'm telling you about this thing called fellowship, that your joy may be full. Now, is there anybody here that's just got more joy than they can use? <laughs> if you're here and you've got more joy than you can use, I want you to see me after service because I want a transfusion. Yeah. <laughs> I want some of your joy. I want my joy to be full, but I also want your joy to be full. And the Word of God is telling us that our joy can be full when we're in fellowship with Jesus and fellowship with one another. Amen. Glory! Amen. You know, fellowship is just a wonderful thing. Yes, amen. But fellowship requires some common ground. Fellowship requires some connections. It requires some like-mindedness so that we can fellowship. 
you know, just coming together, you know, like we do every four years as a nation, and, and uh, we go through all these, these cycles, these uh, political cycles, and all these election cycles. Uh, brother and sister, uh, that's not fertile ground for, for fellowship. Because we're butt heads. Arguing. Fellowship is a wonderful thing when we come together in a common cause. Well, brother and sister, I want the common cause at Elm Grove to be the reaching of the lost with the message of Jesus and His love. How that Jesus can and will forgive you if you ask. If you ask, He can and will forgive you. And brother, I'm here to tell you that Jesus wants to fellowship with you. And He will come and sup with you. Amen? We all need fellowship. Now I call that fellowship the in Christ fellowship. And we need fellowship with our God. In those dark hours, in those times of grief, oh, it's the fellowship with Jesus that gets us through the darkest hour. We sing that song in church hand in hand with Jesus. That's a sign, a song of fellowship. Amen. Amazing grace is a song of fellowship. It's a song of fellowship. I believe fellowship with Christ is the best and the most important fellowship you can have in your life. Why? Because fellowship with Christ brings joy, peace, and love into our hearts. Our lives are changed when we fellowship with Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen? Even our spirits are changed when we fellowship with Jesus. We can come in that door, beard down, our spirit pushed to the ground, and the Holy Ghost begin to move, and the Word of God and the power of the Word of God come, this wonderful praise of Word, and all of a sudden our spirit starts to soar, and we're glad that we're in the house of God. We're glad that we're called a Christian. Yes, amen. And brothers and sisters, I'm glad that fellowshipping with Christ will also change our minds. It'll change our minds. It's because when we're fellowshipping with Christ, we're made into new creatures. We're transformed. Come on, church. We're born again. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, in the book of John chapter 16, Beginning in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Remember, truth is the path we're looking for. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. He starts off telling us it's all about truth. And the truth is, that it gets expedient. I mean, it's necessary. It needs to happen quickly. It's essential that I go away. 16. 16, verse 7 through 11. Truth, that's the path. God said, it's expedient that I go. And why? For you. Because I want to fellowship with you. I want to be in you. See, God is constantly preparing us for what we need. He's constantly preparing us. Preparing for us what we need. That's what the cross was all about. It was Him preparing a way of escape for us from our sin. And we know and we believe that He's preparing a place for us called heaven. In my house are many mansions of heaven. I believe that God has a plan for your life and that the paramount part of God's plan for your life and my life is fellowshipping with us. Remember, we have to have like-mindedness for fellowship. We have to have common ground for fellowship. We have to have harmony for fellowship. I'm glad that I found this person, Jesus Christ who gave me unconditional love. All I had to do 
was confess and repent. Take a hold of his hand. And follow him. Follow his word. Follow his love. God will set you free. But he'll also keep you free. He'll also keep you free. He wants to fellowship with us. So think about this. The God that created the universes, everything that we see, know, and think, and feel, He created. And He wants to fellowship with me and you. He doesn't want to just be a friend that you see once in a while at a meeting. He wants to be a companion. In fact, He wants you to be adopted and become a part of His family. Amen. God wants to fellowship with you. Not just here and now, but forever. Now that ought to get you excited a little bit. Come on. Some of you are getting closer to forever than the rest of us now. I love it. I'm close. Never mind. I'll stop meddling. I'll go back to church. Get the preaching going. Verse 8. And when he is come, he, the Holy Ghost, will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, this word reprove, the Holy Ghost has come to reprove. See, this word means several things. One of the things it means is to scold or correct gently. Gently. Another is express disapproval of something. And then of course to convince us of the truth of God's word. And lastly, reprove also means to convict. So with that in mind, think about this. The Holy Ghost has come to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not only we can't say we believe in Jesus Christ and practice sin. We can't say that we believe that He died and went through what He did on that cross so we can keep on doing the same thing that He died to set us free from. Amen? Amen. He says He comes to reprove the world of sin because I go to my Father and you see me no more. The Holy Ghost wants to Reprove the world of righteousness. Well, that doesn't seem that up. But it really does. Because the righteousness that he's referring to here, that the Holy Spirit was talking about, is self made righteousness. The meism of modern day. And then judgment. Jesus came in righteousness to judge. And to judge what? Sin. And to finally put an end to the prince of this world. That old liar. Lucifer. Satan. You know the one that the truth is not in? Now today is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday is always 50 days after Easter. It's a week of weeks. <clears throat> On the first Pentecost Sunday that we have recorded in the Bible, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit infilled 120 people and the church was born. We're the same church, you and I here today, that was born that day. On the day of Pentecost. On that day, 3,000 people joined the church in one day. Boy, would we have a dilemma if 3,000 joined this church in one day? It'd be a month before you could catch me. I'd be out here running around hollering, screaming, having me a 
personal revival and joy that's people and full of glory. Yeah. You know what? Those 3,000 people that joined the church on that day, you, you, you know what I'm, I'm kind of being general here. Those, those 3,000 people started believing in Jesus Christ. You know, it's possible that even those Jews, some of those Jews that we talked about earlier that were believers, maybe, maybe they were there on that day. And that's the day that they became believers when they heard Peter preach his first song. You see, on that door, on that day, God opened a door of fellowship that man had not been able to enjoy up to that day. That door of fellowship was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit begins to speak out through you in languages that are not trained or understood or studied. In that voice of God. Some modern preachers call it a prayer language. It doesn't matter what you call it. It was still the voice of God speaking through normal everyday people that dared to believe. What did it do? It brought the comforter into the heart, the mind, and the soul of that 120 people and thousands of sins. And I count myself as one of those. You see, Jesus is the door of fellowship. Revelation 3.20 Revelation 3.20 Behold! I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him. He will be. What a beautiful picture of fellowship. Arm and arm with our Savior, our Lord. Today, we are prepared for communion. Could a couple of you fellows come and pass out the sacraments today?
if you open and only you have control to open that door. It is totally and completely yours to do. You have the authority. So before we celebrate the great gift that was given to us in heaven, let's take a moment. I'll look at me and you look inside you. Examine yourself and ask God, is there anything in my life, God, that's not pleasing to you? Is there any habit? Is there any tradition? Is there anything that at all that God, you will see us in? Not the church see us in. Not the preacher see us in. God, is there anything in my life that you will see us in? And if there is, right now, this moment, something comes to your mind, right there, speak out the words, right where you are. You don't have to raise your hand or come from just right where you are. Ask God to forgive you in the name of Jesus Christ. And he will. Let's take a moment. Oh, Father, I open myself. Oh, Holy Spirit, turn on the searchlights of heaven. Look in my mind, my soul, my heart, my life. If there's any wicked thing, any sin that's in me, I confess it and I commit it to you. Oh, God, forgive me. Purify me. Make me whole. By the blood of Jesus, by the faith, and by the promise of the Lord. Jesus gathered his followers for him that night. He took a loaf of bread, tore off the piece. And he told them, Yes, this is bread, but it represents my body, which is about to be broken for you. Everything that Jesus went through on the cross was for our good. That our sin that our disgrace and our shame, even our bodies can be healed by his Christ for the He willingly gave up his body. Let's hold the symbol of the body of Jesus as we bless. Father God, we thank you that you loved us beyond the understanding of human understanding of life. Oh, you sent Jesus and he was beaten, he was spit upon. He was nailed to the tree. His side was ripped. All this was done so that his body could take upon all of our sin and our life. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made, Jesus. We thank you, God, for letting it happen. You love us that much. Bless now the symbol of the body of Jesus as we partake in the name of the Father.